Okay, welcome everybody that's in the room and welcome everybody that is uh, joining us online tonight. If you are joining us online tonight, you're missing free four inch blue bonnets and free GM plants and free um, ripe skull cap plants. Heart leaves, excuse me, heart leaf skull cap plants that are all on the back table for all the persons here to uh, take home. They need a, they all need a home. Not the persons here, the plants. <laughs> and okay, we're going to start off with field trips. We have the fabulous field trip committee, and our next. Uh, hmm, look at this here, and it's going to jump and jump down every time I somebody says something. Um. Next one is to the Galt site on March 19th. And let me do a little housekeeping here and see if I can pick up talking Beth Irwin and move. Yep. Yeah. All right. 9.30 to noon. And if you have specific questions and you're in here and you want to ask about them, Kathy Galloway is the field trip committee leader, and we should all give her a big hand for the job they do. Um, Notice that the entrance gate may be open for a limited time, so we may lock the door behind us. That is not an uncommon thing on Nipsock field trips. So this is not where you cannot get into the Galt site. You can't drive up there and visit it on your visit it on your own. You have to be with a group, like us swell people, and we have water and snacks and so forth. So once you get off of the little highway that you're on, you will be on an unpaved track, sort of gravelly. But anyway. The next uh, field trip, April 23rd to Native American Seed in Junction, Texas. For those of you that are not here, it will be on the, our website, but there are some very specific directions. There's not an address that you can plug into your phone and it will take you there. Um, there's gonna be a sign up sheet through the website, but for those of you in here, I had about 20 copies of the instructions back there on the table. Uh, and then we have a wonderful trip planned in uh, Waco in, on May 21st to the Lake Waco Wetlands and Waco Mammoth National Monument if you want to go. And I think there's a really good place to eat mixed in there also. It's all optional. Um, and then we've got the three plant surveys. And who knows what else will surface between now and then for us to go see and look at. Next big thing for most of us or some of us, for me and Randy, is the plant sale. <laughs> so 10 to three, I've already posted the first plant list or available plant list on the blog for you to download. The state web hosting has been kind of um, erratic in the last two weeks. So I've also put it on our Facebook page, a link to straight to the list on our Facebook page. I'll probably update it in a couple of days. It's not gonna change very much. We really have a pretty stable inventory. And I do request that if you're signed up to work sales that morning, would you please download that list and read it? So you will know where stuff is and know what stuff is there when people come asking because they will come with that list with their item underlined. And I'll have it, I'll make it as easy for you to find stuff as I can, but it would work a lot better if you were familiar with what we have. All right, here's some of our stars. I did put some things or put in my post saying that we had our, uh, our plant list was available. I highlighted some things and after I got it posted, I thought, you know, I forgot some things. So really neat is um, the long flower tuberose, Manfreda longiflora. Now last meet, last uh, plant sale, we had Texas tuberose, but this one is bigger and prettier and more robust with bigger flowers and smells real good. So that's not something very common. And then I think I mentioned on the blog site, but our, our, our big rare thing that we have this time that Barbara has been growing and trying to get enough to sell for two or three years now, is uh, Cory's pipe vine, Aristolochia corii. Now, pipe vine is the larval food for a uh, for the eastern black swallowtail butterfly. Is that right? No, that's parsley. Pipe vine swallowtail, which looks like the eastern black swallowtail. <laughs> not eastern. <laughs> Quit, Beth. Talk about plants and not butterflies. 
Anyway, it's a tiny little thing. It's native to crevices and crags of canyons. And I think we're going to have it in hanging baskets because it is just so diminutive. That little flower, it's that perfect little Dutchman's pipe, but it's just, you know, like an inch or two long. So that'll be one of those that people are lined up for extra early because they're, when they're gone, they're gone. Another uncommon thing, we had this at the last sale. We didn't have very many of them and they looked like the devil, but every one of them had a green leaf I brought to the sale and every one of them disappeared very early in the sale. So, but we'll have uh, a couple of dozen prairie flocks this time. They are more of an Eastern type species, but they will, these are from a more Western uh, uh, location. So, and then we'll have uh, regal sage or mountain sage this time too, hopefully. All right, upcoming programs. We have Gil Eckert next month, and he is just fabulous. Uh, native plants for the birds. His pictures are astoundingly beautiful of birds, native birds on native plants, and his yard that he has all done just for the birds, you know. And then we have Chris Ebling on tree identification techniques. And then June 9th, we are open. And I'm thinking I may plug, unless somebody, this is something we really need some input for speakers. Susie has been working very hard and we are not getting great response in those that we're asking. So if you've got, we don't just need ideas for people who speak on appropriate subjects for the Native Plant Society of Texas. We'd also like to hear some suggestions for topics, okay? If you can't, if you don't know a person, if there's something to do with native plants you'd like to know something more about, know, know more of, then send us that information too, or ask that also. Help us find some speakers. Um, after preparing this program tonight, I was gonna do a little bit with Gary Bowers Yard, but he's sick and he sent me the information and it was fabulous. <laughs> it's a program unto itself. <laughs> I said, you know, no, I'm not talking about your yard. <laughs> you're gonna talk about your yard when you're well. So we may plug him into June. But anyway, we do, we have some speakers from some months further out, but please, we're getting kind of desperate on speakers. That is that too strong? Is that too strong, Susie? <laughs> it's not too, no, Susie and I think we're desperate. <laughs> so, all right, just chapter events that we have. Some things we need volunteers for, some things we don't. Fern Bluff Elementary Science Night. Uh, Mark Stutzer is going to be our lead person on that. We're going to give away blue bonnets, just like you see at the back of the room, to the families that come to their science night. And that's kind of the reason we have too many blue bonnets, because we were going to give away plugs in January, and COVID canceled their deal. So anyway, we have the plant sale. Wrong day. Wrong day. Oh, it is the wrong day. It's March, y'all, not May. Please. <laughs> Please, yeah. <laughs> anyway, okay. New, fresh, or hot off the press is the April 2nd, is the work day at the landfill. So this is usually done in partnership with a Good Water Master Naturalist, but I don't think they've plugged that in yet. So um, Marilyn Purrs is wonderful to work with. She's, this is our oldest uh, project as far as a, a plant garden that's in, still in existence here in uh, Williamson County. So Vicki Husband and her team of Susie and uh, Marsha are going to do um, the Gary Park Family Nature Fest and have us a booth there. And we're going to give away some little plug plants there. And then the 20th through the 23rd, while some of you are off gallivanting around Native American seed, the library will also be celebrating Earth Day. And so we've been working with them. We've ordered uh, monarch plugs, I mean, uh, milkweed plugs for them to give away. They're going to do a giveaway again this year like they did last year and we're partnering with, partnering with them. I don't know that it'll be that week. It'll be as soon as the plugs come in sometime in April. So um, they are having a celebration. They will have our, uh, our information on hand. And we're going to put some signs in the garden downstairs, which is our display garden. Sort of like our plant sale signs on those plants for that time when people are coming in. We had a work day Oh, sometime in the last 30 days, we cleaned up that bed down there. And they're like ground zero for new people in Williamson County or new people in Georgetown. It's just constantly people coming and they're all new. You know, they're, oh no, I'm from so-and-so. Oh, I've never seen that. So, All right, coming up, we've got 
Native Landscape Certification Program, also Saturday, unless you're out of the landfill. Um, this you can do by Zoom, and then the plant walk is uh, at Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center afterwards. If you would like to start, if you want to take the NLCP classes, you have to take level one first. And this, is the Austin this is the Austin chapter doing it and crossing our fingers. We will be able to offer partner with them and, and offer later on in the year. That's a goal of ours, but they are going to do, I believe, one and two this spring. So. Okay, and congratulations to Mark Stetzer and the Round Rock High School Plant Club. They have won a Nips Up, Bring Back the Monarchs to Texas grant. Uh, we had 94 applicants, about 55 of them got funded. And I inserted myself into the judging committee this year so I could see what was being presented from Williamson County. And I can attest that Mark's was one of the top applications. It was very good. Uh, and I'm hoping that, and I feel certain that we'll be doing a field trip to his garden down there on the Round Rock campus. It's impressive. Um, we had another winner in Williamson County was um, Meridian Charter School. Am I saying that right? Yeah. Okay. Meridian Charter School is down there on the I-35 North Service Road in Round Rock right across from Rudy's Barbecue. So they also were a winner, I believe, Goodwater, Montessori, and Georgetown, which is kind of out behind Rents Brewery in the Industrial Park, was also a winner. So those are all groups that we hope to be able to partner with and see their, uh, see their uh, results. All right, this is how you get a hold of us. And pay attention to this because a big part of our program tonight is get a hold of us. You know, talk to us. I've asked for suggestions, and, and this is the best way to talk to us. If you email us, we answer back. So, and if you can't, if the website's down, go to Facebook or Instagram. One of us here is monitoring it all the time. So, all right, tonight we are giving away a native plant book. And what are we giving away to the ones that are here? Native Texas Gardens, maximum beauty, minimum upkeep. Excellent. And congratulations to Jane who won last month and Teresa from Cedar Park. Thank you. All right, future meetings, live and Zoom speakers. We most record most of them and remind you where you're giving your consent to attend a live meeting to be videoed for Zoom and YouTube, even though I don't think any of y'all are actually on there. Okay, now we're ready for our program. Let me ask if anybody has any questions about business or any stuff we've covered so far before I jump into the program. Nancy Pumphrey, I'll have to repeat your question for the Zoomers, but go ahead. Uh, just that if anyone does want to present, if they have something they want to present, they should contact you or Susie about uh, the meeting, about presenting. Maybe presenting for the meeting, yes. If you just email the website, if you hit contact on the website, you're going to get a form to come up and email. And it's going to, I'm going to see it. If it's program, I'll forward it to Susie. I'm not sure, Susie, if you get, if there's a speaker link on the website. But when I say, if you just, con if you hit any contact button on any of those, I'm going to see it. And, you know, Aaron is going to see it. And two or three others are going to see it. And, you know, we have um, regulators out there. I'm not one of them that, did you see this? Did you answer this? I'm telling you, we're gonna, <laughs> you're gonna get, you're gonna get, you're, you're gonna get heard. <laughs> this is not political. This is not the government. This is not the social security administration. You're gonna get an answer. A live human being is gonna answer you. <laughs> so. <laughs> Jane says she can attest to that. That's right. That's true. She got, yeah, she got excellent. She got hooked up to the blog. I do recommend that you subscribe to our blog. It doesn't cost you anything, but it's it's our newsiest thing. It's the best way to find out what's happening the soonest. All right. As I said uh, last month or the month before, I'd like to start landscaping. How do I, you know, what do I do? What do I plant? Um, 
information on landscaping is one of our biggest questions that we get asked and the hardest thing to find speakers on. So in some cases we've got, you know, we don't endorse anybody. We don't endorse companies. We don't endorse commercial landscapers. It's just our policy. And so that eliminates those people as being speakers really to speak before us. So here we go, okay. This is one of my favorite pictures of landscape plants or native plants. Does anybody recognize where this is? No, this is the view from the pickup window at Jason's Deli in Georgetown. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes, that's I-35 behind you, but it's just the most pleasant vignette when you're sitting there waiting for your food. So, and it, it's well done. I mean, it's a path to nowhere, but you don't know that when you're looking at it. So, but it's, it has that element of mystery. I wonder what's back there. <laughs> An 18 wheeler is back there. So, but landscaping in general is something it's too big to fit in one PowerPoint. It's too big to fit on one screen. You know, it's a big, big subject. That's why we're taking it in small chunks. So, in the series, we're going to try to help you. Make decisions by learning from others, other persons, winning and losing experiences. Because sometimes you learn as much when you lose as you do when you win. Often you learn more when you're unsuccessful. So this is something I've dealt with all my life in that the general public's perception is, um, is what, you know, it's based on what they see and experience and what they've lived in and what they, you know, it's just, well, this is how this house is, it must be all right. So you have decisions you can make. And sadly, it's especially out here, I find, because I, I came from an area that was losing population and underdeveloped, but out here, it's very, very obvious that the building contractors, these, this is what's happening. Um, they hire a landscaping subcontractor and they're mandated by the city code or whatever to put in two native plants or five native plants or whatever. So you get a, a Southern live oak. You don't get an escarpment live oak because those don't live in pots and the landscaper can't get those. You get a Southern live oak. It was an acre and it fell on the ground in Houston or east of the Mississippi River. And they, they're all watered and they all come up. So here they come to Williamson County, and then you get, um, you might get a couple of uh, dwarf yopons, which yopons are native, but the dwarf ones are from stock that are from way east, and uh, for some color, they might put in some society garlic, uh, and they're going to put in a couple of other things that we look at, but they're just their, their basic thing, and I've <clears throat> really been depressingly amused at watching these really close, these subdivisions have gone up really fast and they'll be, it's like they have a pattern. Okay, we're gonna put a, a live oak here and a Mexican white oak here and a cedar elm here and they'll pick, you know, and then a, then a live oak and a Mexican white oak and a cedar elm. So actually just, you know, instead of using, you know, don't make the street all live oaks. Let's mix it up a little bit, but you, you'll see that. You'll know what I'm talking about. So, uh, so that gets us to tonight's example. And I probably need the lights down. Somebody back there that knows how to do that. So. <clears throat> Can I lose, can I lose this one? Oop. No, it's fine. You don't take notes. Go ahead and turn it out. That's better. Some of these pictures are not wonderful because they were taken in this lovely winter weather we've been having. Yeah, yeah. right. We're in a movie show. You're in a movie, that's right. And I'm sure I'll look spooky from the... <laughs> no, okay. okay, all right. <laughs> this is Bill's house and um, Bill came looking for, I think I have that in the show. Here's an aerial of Bill's house. And this is one of the things about landscaping that be, living in 2022 is just fantastic. When I first started as a freshman in horticulture in college, I was on the landscape design track and my professor put me in architecture 101 where I had to draw plans. <laughs> like, uh-uh. 
this is no, I'll take all the chemistry I have to take. I can't do this. So, uh, but nowadays you can go on Google Earth, you can find your house, you can put it on two dimensional and zoom down on top of it. And you can, and you know your house well enough to know where your border is, like I've done here. And you can hit print screen on your keyboard and open up Word and paste it in there. And all of a sudden there you have a sheet of paper that you can print your lot on. And you can lay a piece of tracing paper over that picture and you can draw your driveway and your house and your perimeter and whatever on that piece of tracing paper. And then you can go out with your measuring tape to that driveway or that long flower bed right there and actually measure them. And then you can come back to your tracing paper or put another piece on and say, okay, this is 20 feet wide. So all of a sudden you have some scale that you can start drawing your landscape picture with. Thank you, Google Earth. Right. With Bill, he had some plants there when he bought the house that he really didn't like. And one of them was this black willow. Now, it's extremely perplexing to me that anybody would put black willow in their landscape. And I don't know how many of y'all are from the East and are familiar with black willow. It is a pioneer species, means it comes in on bare ground, bare wet ground, usually after a river or bayou or something is flooded and brought in some new fresh dirt or new sandbars and in the spring floods and the willow tree seeds are spread by wind and they blow and they come up and that's their job is to cover bare earth. They are an aggressive water seeker. I don't understand how a commode in his house still flushed with a black willow like that, that close to it. But he was, he was worried about it. And uh, he also had a line of them on the other side. Maybe I should silence my phone. Anyway, that's, he removed that. And one of the things he found when they cut it down was there was a woodpecker hole in it. And so he said, oh, I want that piece. And so he sent me this picture this spring of that ladderback woodpecker. And you can see he's got his suet uh, tacked to the thumb. So they, they have that up there in the yard, very close to where the willow tree was. So they can see it out the kitchen window. And no, the woodpecker apparently does not care that it's not however many feet up in there it was. <laughs> the hole is hard to come by. So the other thing he had there, and this is what endeared him to me, when I found out about it, was he had about six ornamental pears, the new invasive species. So they're coming up all in our wetland areas. They're awful. I think the, the state in, in the state in the lower 48 that is the most rigid about um, non-native species and, and uh, invasive species is North Carolina. And they have forbidden their growers and yes. People call them Bradford pears. Okay, Bradford pears, ornamental. When they first hit the market, they were sterile, but you know, something happened out there and now they're not. And they make those little knotty pears that the birds will spread around. They are a very low value tree. But anyway, it's you're they even have a program in North Carolina that if you bring evidence that you've cut one down, they'll give you a native tree. So but that's, and they're all over. And they're some of those cheap landscape contractor subdivision trees because they grew very fast. And most of you know that they are very brittle. Um, the wind takes them out, that's right. They, are, they do have pretty fall color. They're about to start flowering and they stink to high heavens. So, and we advocate putting in Mexican plum instead, which smells wonderful and is very strong. Okay, let's look at what was there in uh, Bill's yard pre yuri okay? The yellow circles are, were pink. Uh, and I know they don't look, they look purpley on the screen here. I don't know what they look like on Zoom. On my laptop, they're pink, but they were pink. Um, autumn sage, and they've all died. They all died. They're not an especially long lived species. So, but the pink ones do last pretty good. All right, we had some dwarf yopons here. Uh, and the one with the complete circle behind, uh, with, uh, yeah, behind the bird bath, 
it is dead to about six inches from the ground. The rest of them are completely unscathed. Um, and then we have the evil twins here that were in front of the uh, either side of the front door. Well, there's two right there and there was one you can't see in the picture it was on the other side of the front door. And then the one that I don't have demarked, that one remaining dark green plant is Chinese holly. And that is another very common, you know, subdivision species. So it's not considered invasive, I don't think. Um, the deer will keep it grazed down for you if it gets too big or whatever, but the birds do eat these seeds. And then the orangey plant down in the bottom is a chrysanthemum. So this was taken later in the year. What were the ones with the squares? The ones with the squares, I will tell you about in a minute. They are uh, Chinese fringe, but we're gonna double down on Chinese fringe in a minute. So, all right, now this is what it looks like. Same shot, you can see the same yopon there. And maybe you can see the detail of the sticks. You can see that black round circle that has got cast iron planted or aspidistra. And there's some more of it on the other side. And the green ball in the far background beside the oak tree is a, uh, a standard yopon, holly, another native that will tolerate being pruned in any shape you would like. So, but you can see the down there in the gravel in front of the rocks, the stumps from the uh, um, autumn sages. Okay, Chinese French. This is over here on the right, and it's not in good focus, and I don't care because, you know, we don't need to be planting it. The one on the left is the one that's in Bill's yard that's left. And the one on the right is more an idea of the color that it should be. It's also Laura Petalum. Um, it is one that jumped into the landscape oh, 20, 23 years ago. Very fast growing, very easy to propagate and it's got color. So, but it does like a little more acid soil. And so the contractor that put in bills said, you need to throw your coffee grounds on it every morning. I got news for you. There's not enough coffee grounds in Williamson County. <laughs> to counteract the water in our limestone wells and in Lake Georgetown and in our other Corps of Engineer Lake reservoirs that all of our water comes to us from. So anyway, that's what it, and, and they died just because they're weak. They're, you know, they're not nutritionally in good shape. So and the original ones that came out onto market were, you know, if left unchecked and in their natural state, they would get about as tall as the ceiling. So they were more of a small tree, but they were being sold as a shrub. And they weren't in there more than three years until people realized, hey, this is, this is too much. This is too much pruning. And they got busy and they hybridized and they, they brought them down to the point that there's one that will actually kind of go in a hanging basket. It's that carpet and rug-like but it's very expensive and those landscape contractors are not gonna buy that. Uh, it's one that Southern Living promotes. Well, that's fine. Southern Living is in Birmingham, Alabama. They've got the soil over there for that. Uh, it's not native. It is not uh, invasive. As far as I know, it does not make viable seed, but it is. Uh, it has definitely invaded our landscapes. So if you've got it, you need to get rid of it if Yuri didn't do it for you. Okay, this is what was on the other side, some uh, sago palms. He lost another one that matched it on the other side of the sidewalk from Yuri. And that um, ragged looking one back behind the rock among the pots is a um, holly fern. And so it's, it kind of needs to be trimmed. And you can see the, the, the yopon holly over there still in the ball has been pruned so much, and I think it was probably pruned before Bill bought the house, that it's, it's suckering very freely, and that's not something I normally see with Yopon Holly, but I don't normally see them, the big ones trimmed in a ball like that either. So, and it, there's some uh, red, red yucca in front of it, and it's full of Yopon sprouts. So, not sure what's going on there. All right, other things in the yard. Here's Dwarf Nandina. Now, <laughs> Nandina domestica is on our invasive plant list. It does make red fruit and um, you know flowers that I occasionally will see bees on. This dwarf creature came out um, 
in the 70s, I think. I remember when it came out because I had been through plant pathology and you know weeds and that kind of thing. And so I was pretty familiar academically with what herbicide damage and viruses looked like on plants. And to this day, that still looks like it's been hit with herbicide or it's got a bad virus to me. <laughs> I hate it. Bill's real happy with it. So I'm not gonna argue with Bill because it's not going to invade Williamson County. It's gonna sit there just like that. And I kind of studied this picture and I said, well, I see what's going on. This is the kind of thing builders do to us is they, they give us a strip of dirt there between the foundation and the sidewalk that's too small to really hold anything. I mean, a few nice sculptural rocks would be fine right there. You don't have to put Nandina. And then you've got this bump out window over it. But the one thing about the Nandina that I can say positive is it's never going to hang over the sidewalk. It's going to hang right there. You know, it's, you might have to trim a leaf or two off of it mm, every 15 years, maybe. <laughs> it's, it's, it pretty much sits there. In fact, um, I thought about the other positive thing about it is it's almost like it's artificial. Okay. So it's real. So it's not shedding plastic beads. So that was another positive thing I could think about Dwarf Mandata. So he's happy with them. They're staying. All right, here's another one in the yard. This is a Sandankawa viburnum, and I was surprised to see that this is in the Green and Growing Guide for Austin. So it is not cold hardy this far north. Um, he has an HOA that mandates that he has to have uh, a planting or covering or some kind of screening from the street for his air conditioning uh, unit there. The, and, and that's what was put there was a Sandankawa viburnum and I looked online for pictures of the thing. And it's kind of a substitute for uh, um, wax leaf ligustrum or, or Chinese holly. It's a five or six foot hedge that you can keep pruned and it has little white flowers part of the year. I've never seen one that didn't look like that from just being constantly frozen back and, and, and battered and beaten. Plus it probably doesn't like all that heat exhaust coming off of the unit either. A bird uh, dropped him a seed of palmetto um, there off of the eaves of the house or something. So he's got a pretty good sized palmetto uh, plant right there. And it is right in front of the gas meter. And it is now big enough to screen the, uh, the unit. So I told him, I said, I'd just go ahead and try to get rid of those viburnums, but don't let the guys hit a gas line. So I don't, that kind of thing's kind of scary to me, but anyway. He's got, he had two or three of those that I, he didn't plant that were already there. And then there's a little dead plant down there in the corner. And that is a um, dead, uh, it is a native, Texas sage, Cenizo. Some of those didn't fare too well in the freeze. All right, his problem is he, he wanted to remove, or he did remove the pear trees. So the, the trio on the far left-hand side of the house were the, some of the pear trees and then there was some back here on the other side that because it's wonky jawed in here y'all can't see it in here and um and he's got a live oak tree in the front yard and and then a white oak i think immediately beside the house and then yeah the top over there is the willow tree you can see how big it was over the house which is why he removed it the willow trees were already gone when this picture was taken on the right I believe where that wooden bed is, a bed, that raised bed is, is where the willow trees were. There was a line of them. He showed me a picture of it and I just didn't take it with me. So this gives you a kind of idea of what he, he just, he, he emailed us. He reached out to our website and said, I want some Texas red, but actually he says I want some Oklahoma red buds. Cause he's from Oklahoma, but that's the same thing as the Texas red bud. So we happen to know where some were. What he wanted to do, this is the, dead spot over here or brown spot over there is where the stumps from the uh, pear trees were browned out. He, he just wanted to kind of delineate where his property was. He wasn't putting a hedge on the property. He just said, I want something out the kitchen window. I look out there and I know that's where I want. So we ended up, we got him four and he put two on either side. And then he, uh, he didn't realize how small red buds were. So, or how short they are, Texas redbuds are. And I had um, 
sent him a couple of places to look at some. So if you wanted something bigger, we've got some nice Texas ashes. And he's, oh, I like that idea. So there's a third plant back there, and that's a Texas ash. So he's ended up with two red bugs and a Texas ash. And he had a dude already that would dig the hole, which was, you know, more than he was going to get out of me. <laughs> so. On the left here is this bed. This is an interesting little raised rock bed, and it's full of natives. It's got an anacacho orchid tree at either end of it, and it's got some um, autumn sage in it, and it's got a grass, and I do not know whether it's going to be, I think it's a muley. I don't know if it's going to be gulf muley or big muley. And then there's a couple of other stumps in there that I'm not sure what they are, but I'll come back when everything greens up. The picture on the right shows you the rusty spots there. That's where the um, um, pear trees were on and where the new red buds are now. Here's Texas red bud. See, Erin, this is a pain. Maybe I need to move it down. No. Well, sorry, y'all local folks. This is also a preview of our new plant sale signs that Randy and I have been working like Turks on. Well, not Turks, but we've been working real hard on it. So this is uh, the Texas red bud one, and uh, that gives you an idea of what he's going for there. They're fabulous. They're already in flower. There's one in full bloom on Highway 29 or University in uh, Georgetown, right in front of Raising Canes. But uh, they're really neat as a native tree because they are raised from seed. So you've got a good DNA mix of them. And so you have, they're blooming over a long period of time. You'll have some that are in full bloom right now and some that haven't even cracked any pink color. And that really is exciting for migrating butterflies and, and bees coming out and so forth. This is a really good nectar source for them over a good, nice period of time. It's not a clone. And then Texas ash. We need a fall, good fall color picture of Texas ash because it does have really good fall color. And it is uh, excellent larval host and seeds and cover for birds. And they did beautifully during Uri as opposed to the non-native Arizona ashes that died in many, many, many people's yards. Have y'all enjoyed the pruning? Oh, but you didn't put it there. Yes, a con you, put the t you put the Arizona ash yeah. there? Shame, Erin. <laughs> She didn't know any better. She didn't know any better. That's right. It is a tree. The Arizona ashes were, they were one of those subdivision trees, though, because about every third yard in my neighborhood, which is 20 years old, has got an air, you know, has a partially dead Arizona ash. And I think only one neighbor had sense enough to cut it off at the ground. There's lots of them that are kind of lobbed off like crepe murder, uh, so, <laughs> waiting to see what happens there. So <laughs> anyway, we replace, we are replacing the, haven't done so yet because of the predicted 25 degrees and the, the new plants have been in cold frames. They haven't been in greenhouses, but in pots, we don't want to have to do a, a fresh, fresh out in the uh, wild when it's gonna drop down to 25 degrees. We're going to replace um, with some more pink uh, autumn sage. We're gonna allow the, uh, I'm gonna put some white up here. It's very shady under that oak tree at the door. So we're gonna put some white autumn sage because it really pops in the dark, in the darker areas. And then I'm uh, gonna do some Turk's cap. He's got lots of stuff for hummingbirds around his house and they do like to feed the birds. and so. We're gonna do Turk's cap right in front of the front door where the uh, purple fringes were. There's Turk's cap, just an absolute necessity if you want hummingbirds. And then the pink salvia greg eye. And then there's a white salvia greg eye. Any questions pertaining to this project? Yes. Don't you think the turkey's caps live in the basement? No. No. Do what? Well, I think it depends on what soil you're in. 
Yeah, because like I played it in Austin plays, uh -huh. and it, it just takes over the place yeah. everywhere. It's aggressive. So, yeah. <clears throat> aggressive. Okay. okay. Yeah, aggressive. Okay. Yeah. Could be. I mean, I guess, but. I'm a person. You're taught. You're you're questioning a person who thinks that there can't be too much turks cap because you can't <laughs> you can't have too many hummingbirds, can you? I mean, really, <laughs> can you? <laughs> or can you have too many Gulf fritillary butterflies? They love it. Or can you have too many yellow sulfurs? Yes, Elsa. I mean, I live in Sun City at the Horticulture Club. I have pulled out pulled out so many feet of the roots of that plant, but it took over. That's why I just got because my neighbor has one in the front yard that I take care of. And, you know, that's my concern for him. Okay, for those of you that are on Zoom, we're having an argument over the pluses and minus of tarts caps, and I'm just, <laughs> you know, no. A lot of landscape is perception, is perception is what do you want with your yard? I mean, when I'm, we bought our house five years ago, it was barren and completely devoid of anything that any insect, spider, bee, hummingbird, or butterfly, anything would want to ever visit. And we'd been living on a nature preserve that I managed that we started for 25 years. You know, we were used to dozens of species of birds at our feeders all the time. And all these, you know, we were used to an abundance of it. So, and it's taken five years. You know, I would walk the dog around the neighborhood. Well, here was a lady that had a bunch of turks cap and I could hear the hummingbirds chittering all over the place. I'm like, I want you at my house. <laughs> so after five years of of planning and working at it. Now I'm the cool place to hang out in the neighborhood, which is how I wanted it. I don't care if her hummingbirds don't come back if they stay over at my house. So that's, that's, that's the kind of argument you're trying to argue with somebody on Turks Gap. So what else do we, do we have others? Um, here's a question from Martha Richardson. Are white and pink salvia cultivars or do they occur naturally? White and pink both occur naturally. So, and of all this, and we're, Randy and I are very careful about salvia gregi. A lot of the cultivars that are out there are crosses with northern Mexico species that have not actually been found in Texas, and we don't sell them. We don't sell hot lips because it's a cross with a species not native to Texas. Um, definitely white occurs in nature and pink occurs in nature. So, And same with the uh, tropical salvia too. So. Any other Zoom questions? Um, well, is there any concern about ash borers from the Texas ash? I thought that the ash borer stuff was pretty much hysteria. And you know, when it showed up in Tarrant County, it turned out that it was a 11 or 12 year old on iNaturalist that took a picture of this strange bug. What is this? And it turned out to be an emerald ash borer. It wasn't because somebody called AgriLife and said, my ash tree's dying. Will you come out here and see what's wrong with it? So it is a bug. And I had it, it was in the parish in Louisiana where we came from. And I never, it doesn't move around. It doesn't fly like some, you know, it's like some the gypsy moth or any of those. It, it has to be carried, you know, it has to be hauled. And so, you know, if you go see your in-laws in Arkansas, do not bring home a load of firewood, okay? That's the, it's just... No, that's kind of, uh, you know, it hasn't yet turned out to be for us. Um, but you do need to be, you know, don't transport raw wood, you know, from other areas, especially eastern areas. So, anyway. But I think the emerald ash borer needs help. He needs to hitch a ride on something. So. We don't want him. No, we don't want him. So any other questions? Okay, if you want some one-on-one -on -one plant landscaping advice, come to the plant sale. I mean, come buy plants, but if you're not ready to buy plants, just come like after 12 o'clock. Randy has set up an information booth for us there or for you there or for anybody there of our experts that will love to listen to your landscape problems and your questions and discuss things with you. And I would say, I'm saying after 12 o'clock because it is like crazy between 10 and noon. But the doctors are going to be in there between 10 and 3. So, and that's one of the things 
we like. And Kathy Galloway is going to be one. Sue Wiseman, her sister, will be one. And they'll tell you that's one of the things we enjoy the most about plant sale is talking to the customers and having them tell us about their yard, what they're trying to do, just sit down and discuss it. So do that. It's free. You don't have to buy a plant. We're not going to twist your arm or anything. We don't have a better way to reach out for you than that. Okay. I'm looking for ideas, y'all. I mean, some of you have solved your problems and some of you haven't solved your problems. So please contact us if you've got some questions. We can work on them. If you do something wonderful, like cut down six pear trees, we may come to your house. 